Uh, it is a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank all of you uh, for your being here, for the invitation and opportunity to be with you. Uh, and we've been studying over the past few days with the parents uh, things about parenting. And I, I want to say a couple things before I get started. One is this is a hugely important topic, but not everybody is going to be married. Not everybody is going to be a parent. Uh, but it's still like you stop and think about some people in the Bible. Jeremiah, never married, never had children. Jesus, never married, never had children. Paul, never married, never had children. And they couldn't have done some of the things that they did. Like, I don't, I can't imagine how Paul could have done what he did if he had been busy having the responsibility for Mrs. Paul and, you know, three little ones. Uh, and so there's all sorts of places in the kingdom for, you know, different roles and different things. But Paul, who wasn't married and didn't have kids, talked about raising kids and talked about what kids need to do. In Hebrews 13, even though everybody's not married, says let marriage be had in honor among all. So whether we're not married yet or whether we're married or whether we're widowed or a uh, widower, we can still honor marriage, respect other people's marriages and want good in that. Um, we talked about early child training. We talked about the importance of, of learning the word no and just the things that that does. How it learns respect for authority, that behavior is more important than desire, that you have to control yourself and that you won't always get everything you want. And that when a one and two year old learns that at that age, that's going to benefit them a lot when they hit their teen years. And it's just uh, and throughout our life we need that. Then we started looking, we've used this as kind of a theme verse, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. And we went over mistakes that we can make. And as we pointed out, if you're parenting, you're going to make mistakes. Uh, it kind of like if you're a cook, you're going to have things that sometimes don't go right. Sometimes something burns. Sometimes something's too salty. Don't, you know, get all alarmed after that and feel you know, horrible about yourself, but, you know, turn down the toaster and next time don't put in as much salt. You know, in other words, learn from the mistake and then, and then grow. And so we talked about the mistake of failing to discipline uh, and over and over in Proverbs, he who spares his rod hates his son, he who loves him, there's your motive, disciplines him, how? Diligently. Number of other verses from Proverbs that we saw on that. Uh, the rod and reproof together bring wisdom, but a child who gets his own way brings shame to his mother. We talked about the mistake of rewarding misbehavior. Child throws a tantrum. Child gets what they want. Guess what you've just guaranteed? More tantrums. It's like they become little pirates. Um, number three, expecting misbehavior, where with one of our children we give up and we just decide, well, he's going to do that. And that's not our job to give up on that little guy. You know, he's, maybe he wasn't as easy as his brother or his sister, but this is a different child and he'll have different strengths and different challenges. Don't give up and just throw in the towel and think, well, he's always going to be that way. No, we're the adults. We're there to train him. Um, the mistake of failing to be consistent. Uh, and we talked about like if in a no parking area, you just kept getting tickets saying, ask you not to do that. Don't, don't do it. I mean it. Don't make me tell you again. You know how much everybody would ignore that. Uh, and children do too. Thinking I don't have time is like thinking you don't have time to get rid of lice. It's not going to get better. You know, go ahead and take the time to train. Failing to control self and the importance of not abusing children, but doing things out of love and keeping control of ourselves, because we can help our children be in control better when we're in control. If we're not in control, sometimes we maybe say, I need you to sit down in your room for a minute. I'll be back in a few minutes and we'll talk about this, but give yourself a chance. Make sure you're doing things for the right motive and out of love. Uh, then we talked about training them, the mistake of training them to disrespect instructions given calmly. You tell them to do something, they ignore it. Okay, uh-huh, uh-huh, in a minute, wait, in a minute, I got to do this. And they don't respond until you raise your voice and yell. Well, that's a very bad pattern because you're training them only to obey once you're yelling. That's, that's a terrible way for the house to go. Train them to, disres to respect 
calm instructions. That brings us to number eight, where we'll start this morning. Paul said this twice, and you know, it's possible for mothers to provoke their children to wrath. But both times Paul talks about this, he singles out dads. Because I suppose it's more common that we can be guilty of this. So look what Paul says in Colossians 3.21. Fathers, provoke not your children that they be not discouraged. And then positively, he says, you know, bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Do this, but don't do this. Colossians, fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but nurture them in the chastening and admonition of the Lord. Some people, and I probably bet there's somebody in this room that grew up in a house like I'm about to describe. Some people grow up in a house where the only reaction you get from dad is either he doesn't pay attention to you or you're in trouble. You can have done a good job on a report at school. Dad, can I show you my report? I I'm busy. You can, you know, you're supposed to mow the lawn. You took extra time to try really do, do a good job. And, and he doesn't seem to notice or care. And you just can't seem to get dad's attention until you did something wrong. And then you're in trouble. That's a bad way to treat children. Children need correction but children also need support and encouragement. You look at Jesus' letters to the seven churches of Asia. Five of them, or four of them, have some correction and some encouragement. Two of them have only encouragement, no correction needed. One of them gets no, there's some encouragement to repent, but there's no praise for what they're doing right, Laodicea. But most of them, it's like, this is what you're doing good. This is good. This is good. This right here, this has got to change. If you grow up in a home like that, sometimes children will end up misbehaving because it's the only way to get dad's attention. And I'm going to tell you a story about a fellow. Uh, he, he became a Christian late in his life when he was dying with cancer. He came back. He was reunited to his wife. He was baptized into Christ and passed away not long after. But when his first son was born, he resented that child, didn't like that child, and didn't want to deal with that child, and he ended up leaving. That child, the mother today, she had for years... For 20 years, she hasn't known where he is or if he's even alive. Um, he got off into, while he was in high school, into a very depraved homosexual lifestyle. And here's how part of it started. After being rejected by his father and then the father leaving, that leaves a hole in a young man's heart where he wishes a man would pay attention to it. Fathers, sometimes girls will get into promiscuity for the same thing. They wish dad loved them, and he doesn't. And there's a yearning for some older man to pay attention to her. And unfortunately, she stumbles across finding out, maybe in adolescence or teen years, that there are ways that older men will pay attention to her. Well, this young man... He was, because of all his problems, he was put in kind of a reform school, and there were security guards, and he kept getting in trouble at school. And their job was, when somebody was behaving badly, to physically restrain the child. And this little boy told his mom, he said, he said, Mom, he said, do you know why I act bad at school? He said, so those men will hold me. These were security guards that didn't love him and didn't care about him. 
But the only way that he could get attention from a man was to misbehave and he found some security in the security guard holding him. And if he could have had his dad being proud of him and loving him and encouraging him and playing with him and spending time with him, that hole wouldn't have been in his heart. So don't, if, 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 if a child is around dad and he just, there's no praise and you're only in trouble, it's, this is a terrible thing to do to a child. Also, don't expect talents beyond their capability. Expect them to do what they can do. Don't expect them to do what they can't. I want to talk about that for a minute because I think most of the time we don't expect enough of children. One of the things that's impressed me about parents of children with special needs <laughs> is how loving and devoted those parents are to those children with special needs and how they're often wise in knowing what the child can't do but still expecting the child to do what they can do. If uh, there's a friend of mine, older man, you study with him, and he was telling me about going to Thanksgiving one time. And there was a family member or somebody that he never met before. It was a number of people, and he didn't know this young man. But he, he was just mesmerized through the meal. The young man had been born without arms. He just had stubs. And he was amazed to see how the fellow ate because he had learned how to feed himself. And he said at the end of the meal, there was you know, more crumbs and stuff on the place at my plate on the table than there was at this young man's. He said he would take the spoon with his mouth and he would position it under you know, the English peas or whatever it was he was gonna eat. And with his nub, he would flip the spoon and he would catch the food in his mouth. And he would position it, and he would flip it. And he would position, and he would flip it. And afterwards, you know, when it's time for desserts and stuff, you know, you're going to have some fudge or this, he doesn't have fingers to pick it up. His mom would just walk by and put a snack on his shoulder. And when he was ready, he, he would pop it in. And my friend was just amazed. Now, that mom, that was a wise mom, and that was a talented young man. But if she would have decided you're going to be a concert pianist, th that's not going to happen. He doesn't have any fingers. Don't expect him to do what he can't do. But how much better than if she had spent her life spoon feeding him or hooking him up to an AV? Oh, he can't feed himself. Yes, he could. So it, it, you, you look at Josiah. And Timothy. We'll talk about them again in a minute. Children and young people can be capable of great, great, great things, but don't expect them to do what they can't do. You know, if your dream was he's going to be a middle linebacker and he weighs 101 pounds, that's not going to happen. If you dream she was going to be an opera singer and she's tone deaf, that's not going to happen. And by the way, don't try to relive your life through your kids, you know, but help them Give them security and a loving home and expect a lot of them because they can do great things, but don't put things beyond their capabilities. And don't be the type of parent where children are, here's a good way to think about this. Were you afraid of your dad? I was not scared of my dad, but I was, I knew, you know, some people are afraid of dad because they don't know what to expect. Some people are afraid of that because they know exactly what to expect. You know, you do good, that's great. You do something bad, you're in trouble. And you know that. Some people grow up in a home where dad's an alcoholic. And he comes home and you don't know what to expect. You know, uh, one time you sass mom and he thinks it's funny. Another time you, you spill the milk and, and he backhands you across the face. And in some of those homes, what you learn is to stay away from dad. So don't provoke, discourage, to wrath. Number nine, 
the mistake of failing to parent with joy. So we're going uh, <laughs> to, a buddy of mine one time was listening to these. He's doing a good job raising his kids uh, today, but while he was still single, I think he, or early married, he was listening to these. He said, he said, I think I got it. Spank them and spank them and spank them. And I said, yeah, that's part of the, the lessons in here, but that's not the whole thing. I, I got a lot of spankings growing up, and I deserved them. Uh, there was one I didn't deserve, and I, I could usually torment mom years later by saying, yeah, that one time she'd, she'd be so sad and so apologetic. It didn't bother me at all because the one that I didn't deserve, there were probably a number of times I didn't get caught for something else, so it evens out. But yeah, there's going to be some discipline, but home should be a happy place. I don't care how many rules are being followed. If it's like, no elbows on the table, pass the peas, thank you, you're welcome. Okay, you know, you're checking some boxes on manners, but there's no joy in that family. Look at these verses about joy, and it talks about between husband and wife and children and all these things. Proverbs 5, rejoice in the wife of your youth. The, that's Proverbs 5. Proverbs 23, the father of the righteous will greatly rejoice and he will have joy of him. Let your father and mother be glad. Let her rejoice who gave birth to you. A joyful heart makes a cheerful face. But when the heart is sad, the spirit is broken. A cheerful heart has a continual feast. Better is a dish of vegetables where love is than fattened ox served with hatred. Proverbs 15. Proverbs 31, the worthy woman, the law of kindness is on her tongue. And Proverbs 17, a joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, the fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace. Have a happy home. Have, have joy. Have things that people enjoy. And if we were in a smaller setting, uh, of just parents talking, I would do an exercise. Uh, maybe we won't do that, except I'll ask you to do it in your head. I want uh, all of you to think about for a minute a favorite memory that you have growing up. Just something that gives you, you know, the warm fuzzies, something real pleasant from your childhood that relates to your family. Let's think about that for a minute. When I've asked this question to various groups of people, almost always it's something very simple that didn't cost hardly any money at all. Never yet have I had somebody say we went to Disney World. And that may be your favorite memory as a child. If so, okay, that's an exception. But sometimes people spend tons of money trying to think, this is going to be a great memory for the kids. They'll remember this. Now think back to what you thought about when I thought, when I asked you, what's something pleasant you remember about growing up? Is it something your parents would have thought that's what they'll remember? And I'd venture to say most of you are thinking about something much more simple. And it was just something that you did together with your mom or with your dad. Maybe it was a weekly routine. Uh, somebody said it was sitting in the Lazy Boy with my dad eating sardines and watching this particular show. Or, you know, once a week, dad would make popcorn or, or making cookies with my mom or something like this. <laughs> and I bet a lot of you, and I'm not trying to make you feel bad if you picked out, <laughs> you know, the time we went on a world tour. That would be pretty cool. Uh, the one guy did remember going on a cruise with his dad, but here's why. His parents were divorced, and he didn't get to live with his dad, and his dad had won two tickets on a cruise. And so he got to go, and of course, it's nice to be on the cruise, but he got to spend those three days with dad on the cruise. So the, the, the routine, you know, the, it might be a game night that you used to do or just something simple. Make sure that you have routines and fun things 
for your kids. And you won't know which one will stick. You know, sometimes we think, oh, this will be great. <laughs> and eh, maybe it wasn't so much. But have a house that has joy in it. Mistake number 10, failing to use rod and reproof. Proverbs says the rod and reproof bring wisdom. What if there's just the rod? You know, a kid walks by dad and dad says, come here, whack, go to your room. What's he learned? Stay away from dad. <laughs> you know, that's, that's not much learned there. And then there's just reproof. My wife, Bertina, she was at Walmart one day, and there's mom with one of these screaming toddlers that was just like angry screaming, all that, I hate you, and he's trying to kick her, and just screaming, pitching a fit. And the mom had, I would venture to say, read, you know, either heard some advice from a pediatrician or read an article in a parenting magazine to explain to the child your feelings. <laughs> and so this little kid, he's sitting there, he's screaming and yelling, and he's trying to, he's in the little, you know, toddler part of the buggy, and he's trying to kick his mom, you know, I hate you. And, and she's like, it doesn't make mommy feel good when you do that. <laughs> and of course, like we said yesterday, he doesn't go, I'm so sorry, <laughs> you know, I had not realized. <laughs> I assumed that mothers like to be kicked and told that they are hated. It was my way of complimenting you. No, he's trying to make you not be, this is not a revelation to him. But she's, I'm explaining to him how I feel. So, and he just leans forward as far as he can to get his closer face and just yells, shut up to her. He didn't need mom to express her feelings. He needed to learn that that behavior wouldn't be tolerated. Another time is going to be time for fun and games, and after an apology, a hug. By the way, man, with a little one, here, here was often the way it would go when mine were little. Later, they would get some spankings back here. But when they're little, you know, lots of times, you know, some of this will do the job. And so when they're real little, it'll be kind. Oh, no. What did mommy say to do? Mommy said to do it. I said, yeah. And what did you do? I didn't do it. <laughs> I said, so what do you have to get? Spanking. I'd say, and this is just, you don't have to do it this way. I'm just going to share how I did it. I like to involve them in it. So it's not just something happening to them. And so I'd say, I'd say, which hand do you want it on? And they'd go. <laughs> and, then, and, and then I might say, do you want to go tell mommy you're sorry first and then get the spanking? Or do you want to get the spanking and then tell mommy sorry? You know, and I let them choose. And spanking. And said, okay, let's not do that anymore. You know. And then I'd say, no, go tell mommy you're sorry. And they go, I'm sorry, mommy. And then they get to hug. The apology part and the hug part are important. It's not just, you know, if you give a kid a spank and he goes, and goes away mad, you're not accomplishing much there. It's, it's kind of like when you throw people in prison and they don't like it, but they're mad, and then they keep going back over and over and over. The purpose is to change the heart. So there needs to be the apology and there needs to be the hug. But when he's screaming and yelling at you that he hates you and he's trying to kick you, that's not the time for the hug. That's not the time for, you know, oh, and let's get some ice cream. That's the time he needs to be punished. Reproof alone wasn't going to do anything for that kid. Plus, there's value in the lecture. If you grew up in a home where... When you were in trouble, mom or dad brought you and they gave you a talking to, and you got a lecture and then you got your spanking. If you grew up in a home like that, let me see your hand. Now, for those of you with your hand up like that, how many times would you have liked it if the lecture would end and just skip that part and get straight to the spanking? 
yeah, the, the heads are nodding. Why? The spanking is going to hurt here and then be over. But the talk hurt where? Yeah, yeah. What does the Bible say? It's the rod and the reproof that bring wisdom. You know, some of those times is, oh, no, look what I did. If, if mom or dad said, you know, we're not going to talk about it, no correction here, just get your spanking, we're done. It's like, well, that was easy. You know, it's the rod and reproof that's powerful. And also, um, it touches the conscience, and also the anticipation boosts the spanking up bigger than it is. So it doesn't have to be that hard, especially if there's a, a talk ahead of time. And I'll, I'll illustrate like this. None of us like getting shots, right? But if I go into the doctor and he says, you know, Scott, we got to give you a shot. Put your arm out there. Okay, we're done. But if he goes, sorry, Scott. You're going to have to get a shot. Might roll up your sleeve, hold on to something. <laughs> It's going to hurt. <laughs> you know, it's, not, it, it's the same needle, but the other is just it expound a little bit more. It's just more effective. So the Bible says the rod and reproof bring wisdom. A child who gets his own way brings shame to his mother. I like that little child in that buggy who gets talked about all over the country when I'm doing this. Uh, his mom does. All right, number 11. Set the mistake of settling for situation control instead of training the child. Settling for situation control instead of training the child. What did Proverbs 22, 6 say? Did it say control a child and they will go in the right way and not go depart from it? Is that what it said? It said train a child and they will not depart from it. There's a difference in control and train. There are times that we have to control our children, but biblical discipline has to go a lot farther than controlling. If all we do is control a child, then don't be surprised if you have a child that wants this. I can't wait till I'm 18. I can't wait till I'm 18. I can't wait till I'm 18 because they're tired of that control and they want out. And there are fathers who say, and they say it as if they did a good job. They say, well, I told them, you're not going to do that under my roof. I always told them, you're not going to do that under my roof. Well, that's better than letting them do it under your roof. But if that's all you've accomplished, guess what? Your child's not going to live under your roof the rest of his life. And while he's a teenager, he can do it under somebody else's roof. And as soon as he's 18, he can want to get out and do it under his own roof. And if I pat myself on the back, I controlled him and didn't let him do it under my roof. But what he needed to be was trained so that he would control himself regardless what roof it's, he's under. So um, this is Brienne. Uh, this is over, in, we used to live in Prague, uh, and this is uh, when we're over in the Czech Republic. That's April in the back, my firstborn, then Adam, and then Brienne. We had six kids. Uh, we still got one at home, one in college, and uh, these are the oldest three. And this story is about Brienne back when she was three. And now she's raising, she's got a three-year-old herself, um, and she's doing a good job. But when she, Brienne was my easiest child. She was just always smiling, always happy. There was somebody, her nickname was Smiley, you know, and she was just an easy child. I almost never needed to spank her. Bertina spanked her, I guess, several times, I'm sure. I occasionally did, but she was just a good, happy kid and just hardly ever needed any correction from me. Until one day. And we hopped in the car. And she had a booster seat, and she was supposed to get in her booster seat. <clears throat> we hopped in, and I put it in gear, and we backed up, 
and it starts driving. April goes, Dad, Brienne didn't get in her uh, car seat. I said, Brienne, I said, get in your car seat. And she just refused. And I, out of the six kids, it was interesting. Um, like my youngest, he was a skirmisher. <laughs> he would never go, to, he, he didn't go to all out war. You know, he'd live to fight another day. You know, he'd misbehave, get corrected, got in trouble. Okay, sorry about that. No, they, there it is again. But three of them, there was one time when they just decided, I'm not going to obey. And this is the time that Brienne did it. And so, wow. Brienne refusing to obey. So I pulled over. And I usually didn't use a switch. That's what my mom used on me. She'd, we were three boys. And she'd say, go get a switch. And we'd have to go outside. We'd get the switch. She'd line us up. She'd talk to us. She'd, we'd get our spanking. So I thought, no, I'm going to use a switch this time. So I pulled over by a little creek. And I got out. I went and got a switch. And I got out my little darling three-year-old. And we had the talk. And I explained that God gave me a job to teach her to obey. And it's not that I was all that worried personally about the car seat. I mean, yes, car seats are a good idea. I get that. But I grew up, my first memory is driving in the car, looking out over the dash, you know, standing there, you know, and I survived. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that. But I wasn't expecting to have a wreck that day. I didn't have a wreck that day. But the thing was, Pennsylvania has a law that there to be in a car seat, and I'm dad, and I told her to be in the car seat, and she decided she was going to be defiant and rebellious and not obey. So this is a big deal. So I explained to her that God gave me a job, and I've got to teach her to obey. And after the lecture, I spanked her with that switch, and she cried, but not the cry of, of godly sorrow, <laughs> and not the... <laughs> And I said, now get in the car seat. And she got in the car and she sat down beside the car seat. We had the lecture again. Brianne, please this time sit down in the car seat. Gave her a harder spanking. And this time she got up and she sat down beside the car seat. We had the lecture again went over this very thoroughly, you know, and uh, spanked her again. Now, Brianne, you know, please get in the car seat. This time she got up and sat down beside the car seat. I brought her out again. It was like five times. I've forgotten now if it was five times she didn't or on the fifth time that she obeyed. But it was five times, one way or the other. And she finally sat in the car seat. Now, I tell that story to make this point. What would have been easier for me? I can put a three-year-old in a car seat. Would that have trained her? What was little Brienne doing that day? She was deciding to be defiant. What's my job? to train her not to be defiant. Me putting her in the car seat would not have involved her submitting her will to the authority at hand. And so that's what she had to do. Later that day, I was asking, I said, Brianne, I said, why did you do that today? Did you think that daddy was gonna give up? And she went, uh-huh. And that day, for whatever reason, my little girl, she thought I was going to give up, and my little girl needed to find out that Daddy wasn't going to give up. And she didn't give me any more trouble after that. Um, a mom in Maryland some years ago, after that point, she came to me two or three days later, and she said, that was a life-altering experience for me. I had been controlling my daughter, like, you know, I'd make her sit in the high chair. And of course, when they're younger, you're going to have to do some controlling sometimes of the child. 
but she would have a child that was not wanting to obey, not wanting to, and just making her, making her, making her. She said, she said, after hearing that point, she stopped doing that and she started making the girl actually obey. And after just two or three days, she said, my daughter is obeying and my daughter is happier. And that's a beautiful thing. You want a happy, obedient child. Happiness is not the ultimate goal of life. We're going to have to do some things that don't make us happy. But you don't want miserable little kids either. You want kids that are secure, that want to do what's right, that care about other people, and that grow up in respect and serve God. And in just two or three days, she could just see the change in her child. Instead of disobedient, now she's obedient. And instead of conflict, now the child was happy. Um, mere control versus training. They're not going to do that under my roof is not enough. Train them, teach them self-control so they'll behave themselves under any roof. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not, just, he will not depart from it. Train their hearts. That's what you're wanting to do. That's why if he's stomping away mad, you haven't accomplished what you need to do because you haven't trained the heart. Train the heart. There was a story of a little boy I heard years ago. I don't know if it was public school or, or Bible class, but he wouldn't sit down in his seat, and the teacher kept trying to get him to, and finally he sat down and he goes, all right, but I'm still standing up on the inside. And... You know, look into your child's eyes and listen to their voice. If they're still standing up on the inside, we're not done yet. You know, when it's time to sit down, they need to be sitting down on the outside and they need to be sitting down on the inside. Mistake number 12, mistaking taking them to church for bringing them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Ephesians 6 says, fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That doesn't mean make sure that you have them in Bible class Sunday morning and Bible class Wednesday night. Please have your children in Bible class. They can learn. They can be with the other kids learning. They can grow up together being good parents, fluences for each other. But don't mistake that for your job as a parent. Really sad conversation I had some years ago. Went with a brother to pick up a gentleman I'd, I'd never met. He was a member of the church there. And when I met him, I, I was in my 40s at the time. And when I met him, he got to talking to me. And all of his kids, he had four kids, and they were all roughly around their 40s at the time. And... He said to me, he said, we had four kids. He said, not a single one is faithful to the Lord. And that was sad, but then this was really sad. He said, I don't know what happened. We took them to church all those years. And immediately, I could see what happened. Analyze that statement. None of my children are faithful to the Lord. I don't know what happened. We took them to church. Think about your Gospels. Think about your Gospels. Oh, open your Gospel anywhere. Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Put your finger down anywhere in there. Look and see if it's Jesus talking about what you do when you're at church. If you landed on Matthew 26 and you landed on do this in remembrance of me, you did. If you landed in Matthew 18 and it says, if you won't listen to them, then tell it to the church. And if you won't listen to the church, if anywhere else in the gospel of Matthew, it's not about what you do when you're at church. Bring your children to church. Please don't misunderstand me. But this is a fraction of their lives. 
As I said the other day, if, if I bring my child to the hospital because he's starving and malnourished, and they say, what's been happening? And I say, I don't know. I fed him Sunday dinner and a Wednesday night snack every year or every week. Well, you know what the problem is. That's not enough, enough nutrition for a child. So don't make the mistake. Bring your children to church. Come to church. Have your children here. But don't make the mistake of thinking that is raising and training your children in the Lord. Ephesians 6, 4. Fathers, bring your children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Deuteronomy 6. You shall teach them diligent to your sons. You shall talk to them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. And we've got two minutes. I'm going to see if I can get this one in. The mistake of thinking, if we don't allow this, they might rebel and leave the church. You know, maybe your friend or cousin, whoever, it's like you see the posters in his son's room. You let him put that up there? Well, if I don't allow him to, I'm afraid he might rebel, leave the church. You smell something coming from the room, smells like we, well, if I don't allow. See, daughter walks out, you know, low top, you know, midriff showing. You let her dress like that? Well, I don't want her to rebel and leave the church. Let me say something. What good is being in church if you aren't in the Lord? The church at Laodicea, they were still going to church. And what did the Lord say? I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. The directory list is not the book of life. The fellow in 1 Corinthians 5 that was having an affair with his father's wife was still in that church, but he wasn't in the Lord. Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? And entertainment, attire, interests, start training early. Clothing choices. See, Adam and Eve made something just to cover around here. Then God put some clothes on them. In Exodus 28, the priest had some things for glory and for beauty. But to cover the flesh of his nakedness, it said make them breeches that go from the waist, from the loin to the thigh. And obviously that's inclusive, not not including the waist and not including the thigh. That'd be a string. It's, it's you know, this. Um, the only time you see anybody getting dressed to go to the beach and go swimming was when Peter put some clothes on to go swimming and go to the beach where the Lord was standing. Um, the, there, there's a purpose for that security envelope. It shows what should be showed and keeps private what should be private. This shows what's available. There's a different purpose between that fence and that fence. One keeps your neighbor from looking at your wife in the pool. The other one, that guy's not trying to hide his mansion. He wants you to be looking at his mansion. These, if you'll look up your local code for the prison, uh, local prison visiting rules, these are the type of things you are not allowed to wear in there. And there's a difference between that and this. Don't dress your kids like bacon. We're going to stop there, and we'll pick up with number 14 in the next hour. Thank you very much. Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Very much a pleasure to be here. Uh, my good friend Joe Works, when he found out I was here, he wrote last night and he said this is one of his favorite of all places. And I can be in here the, this weekend see a little bit why. And um, if he was here this week and saw all these little ones here, that would really excite him as well. Uh, you're doing so many good things here. 
and may God bless you as, as you raise your children. I want you to look at the words, those last two lines in the song we just sang. Little children soon are grown. Can they face the world alone? As they strive and struggle through, Father, let them turn to you. When our time to go draws near, we may leave our children here. To the new land far away, Father, bring them home someday. I want to, I want to begin with a thought that relates to that. And that is uh, passing along a respect for God generationally. And so I want you to think about like if you've got a legal pad and you take an ink pen and you write very faintly on the first page some numbers or letters. You can read it on that first page, but if you look at the second page, you can't see it. But if you make a deep impression when you write that first page, even when that first page is gone, you can go to the second page and you can read it. If you made a really firm impression, you can pull away page two and you can still read it. There is a point at which we will be forgotten. And I'll illustrate it like this. How many of you can remember and know, if your mom's still alive, obviously it's not just having to remember, but you know your mom's name. First name, last name, you know your mom's name. How many of you know your mother's mother's name? Most of you do. How many of you know your mother's 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 name? There's one. How many of you know her mother's name? Anybody? Okay, there's, there's one somewhere. Um, that's good. Many of us are going to be forgotten pretty soon. Our children are going to know who we were. Our grandchildren are going to know where we were. But unless they're interested in genealogy, a lot of our great-great-grandchildren are not even going to know what our name was. That doesn't mean we can't leave them a gift and, and a model. Because here's the beautiful part. If you really make a deep impression on page one. You can see it for page after page after page, but it keeps getting fainter. But guess what? If we've trained our children in the way that they should go, their page two, they're writing also. And if they train their children, they're writing also. And so the time is going to come when we're gone. And the time will come when our descendants won't know who we are. But if we've trained our children to serve God and train their children, that can go on and on. And so I encourage you to do that. We're talking about avoiding parenting pitfalls. There's, if we, parenting is busy work, it's hard work, there, you make mistakes, you adjust. It's, when we're going over mistakes, the purpose of looking at mistakes is not to torture people because, oh, you did something wrong as a parent. Man, I've done so many things wrong as a, as a parent and a husband and just a human being in general that, you know, it's, we all make mistakes and all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And sometimes there's things we didn't see but parenting is a little bit like driving across country. If you're on a cross country trip, you might make a wrong turn here and there, but you correct it. And as you're going down the interstate, how many times will you adjust the wheel right or left to keep from straying too far out of your lane? Over and over and over. That doesn't mean you're a bad driver. That means you're a good driver. You realize, oh, I'm drifting over toward the side. It's a pretty foolish driver who says, I'm going to just keep drifting. <laughs> no, you know, you're going to hit a tree. We just make corrections in life. So here's one to make, if, if you have this in your mind, correct it. Assuming cultural norms. And these will be encouraged by, you know, our cousin, our friend, our uh, person we grew up with, somebody that had a baby at the same time we did, or, or thinking about our parents' model, and we just say, well, terrible twos. You know, when they hit two, they're just going to be terrible. 
That has never made sense to me. Because two is a fantastic age. If you don't train the child, if you let them throw tantrums and make themselves miserable and make you miserable, well, yeah, it can be a terrible age. It doesn't need to be. Two can be absolutely fantastic. But there's a lot of people let a two-year-old behave really badly because they think, well, they're two, you know, the terrible twos. And then teens are going to be rebellious. I was at a store one time, and there was an older woman. Here was a lady, and she had these adorable two little girls, around four or so. And the older lady said, oh, they're so cute when they're that age. And then she said, not joking. But then they become teenagers, and it's terrible. <laughs> and as the woman stepped out the door, I caught up with her. I said, I said ma'am, I heard what she said. It doesn't have to be that way. And this wise mom said, I know. You know, but there's people, they just have this mindset. Don't, don't take advice from people that don't know what they're talking about. Don't, when people think routines have to be rebellious, uh, here's the deal. It is culturally common, maybe, for some two-year-olds to be terrible. It is culturally common for some teenagers to be rebellious. You know what else is culturally common? Ungodly adults. That's what's culturally common. So, if I don't mind my child being an ungodly adult, then be satisfied with a terrible two and a rebellious teen because they're on the right track for ungodly adult. If that's not what I want, don't accept cultural norms. Josiah, how old was he when he became king? His daddy was king and not a good king, and he died. There's a little eight-year-old Josiah, and he's king. Now, at the beginning, I'm sure there were lots of advisors helping take care of things, but in his eighth year, he decided to set his heart to serve God. And then later, he started the reforms in, 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 in the repairing of the temple and everything. Eight years old in his eighth year, how old was he? Sixteen. You know what? Well, there's lots of temptations when you're a teenager. Yeah, how about this temptation? You're king. You know? <laughs> it's, I don't think I could have handled being king at age 16. Uh, Josiah did. He was king, and he humbled his heart to serve God. Timothy. Um, you remember that Paul found Timothy coming through Lystra and Derby. He picked him up uh, there on uh, the second missionary journey. He went on on that missionary journey, and remember he's described, he's introduced within the context of his parents. His mother was a Jewess, his father was a Greek, he had not been circumcised, etc. Paul wanted to take him with him. If you remember, Paul continues the second missionary journey. He goes up to Troas, Philippi, comes down through and establishes the church at Corinth. There are two or three dates in the book of Acts that we can date from Roman history. There's the death of Herod in Romans 12. There's the switch between Ephesus and Felix later in the book. And there's the time Paul went to Corinth. The Galileo came later to Corinth as proconsul, and we know when he was proconsul. So we can nail down when Paul went to Corinth, give or take maybe a few months. Paul went to Corinth in 50 AD. He's already got Timothy with him. He's gone through Athens, Thessalonica, start, Berea started work there, Thessalonica started work there, Philippi started work there, Troas. Back before that, he met Timothy. So Timothy is late 40s, maybe 49, 40, somewhere around in there, 49, 48 or something. When Paul writes, you know that famous phrase when Paul says, let no man despise your youth, written in 1 Timothy 4, that's in the 60s. So if Timothy is still a youth in the 60s, how old was he in the late 40s? Timothy may have been a teenager. And again, as he's introduced to us in the context of his parents. I can't guarantee exact the date because we're talking relative terms, your youth. Uh, I'm getting old, so if you're you know, 30, you're, you're a youth, <laughs> you know, to me. Although when I was 20, I thought, 30, those are like 
grown people, you know, that type of thing. And of course, you are. You're both. Um, but my point here is what? Don't raise your children with the expectations of the world because you're not intending to raise worldly children. So have higher goals and know your children can achieve those higher goals. Um, chapter, uh, point 15. The, and by the way, point 16 is going to be something here for everybody. It's not going to be just about parenting. It's going to be it's applicable to ch ch children, everybody. Number 15, don't go into defense mode when our children are wrong. There's a lot of parents that do this. I remember one of my kids, one, uh, a friend of mine came to me to let me know when my toddler was like getting out of his seat and crawling under the table during Bible class. You know, he wouldn't, wouldn't stay in his chair and wasn't doing good. And so she came and told me, what did I do? Do I tell her, don't tell me how to raise my child? No, that's my friend. My friend cares about my child, cares about me, and knew that I would want to know what my child was doing because I know what my child's doing when he was me, but I didn't know he was disobeying and doing that there. So I didn't get defensive. That's my friend. I appreciated what she did for me. And then I had a talk with my little guy and so he could straighten that out. But some parents don't do that. Some parents, you don't criticize my child. Why? Do children never do anything wrong? Yeah, they do. Do they ever do something wrong and our friends see it and we didn't see it? Yeah, they do. Um, when you get into a habit of defending, denying, and redirecting blame, so my niece Holly was telling me about watching the, tr the trial kind of for the information of what was going on there of this guy in Waukesha that ran over all those people. And he excuses his behavior. And his mom was interviewed. And she's, you can see where it came from. It's just ridiculous. When you get into a habit of this, uh, you're violating a lot of Bible principles. First Timothy 5.21, do all things without partiality. You ever see those people that when somebody else's child is wrong, that's wrong. But when it's their child, oh, now it's right. You've seen people like that, some of you. Isaiah 5.20, woe to them that call evil good and good evil. And if you start a pattern of bailing them out, don't be surprised if they come to expect it. And maybe in a really, really real sense, like, Mom, I'm in jail. Come bail me out. A better response would be, you got yourself in jail. Learn a lesson. So a buddy of mine, friend also of Joe's, mutual friend of ours, uh, some of you may know him, John Bosworth. Uh, when he retired, he started driving a school bus. And he told me this story about one of the boys on the school bus is taking a black permanent marker and riding on the bus. So he contacts the mom. And it's one of these moms, oh no, you're mistaken. My boy would not do that. No, no, he would not, yes ma'am he did. No, he did not, it must have been somebody else. My boy would not do that. Well, there's video cameras on the bus. <laughs> and as soon as John mentioned would you like me to show you the video? Immediately, what did you do that made him do it? It, it wasn't like, oh, my boy did that? No, it was just strategy one was, no, not my boy. Nope, couldn't be. No, he would never do that. Nope, n never, never my boy. We got video. Why do you, what did you do that made him do it? It just switched from one to the other. That's a horrible thing. Some moms act like their little guy is the center of the universe. And he's not. And a wor one of the worst things you can do for a little guy is encourage him to think that that's the case. And mom may buy into that, and he may buy into that, but nobody else is going to buy into that. 
His first boss is not going to buy into that. His second boss is not going to buy into that. And eventually, all the other bosses that don't even give him a chance are not going to buy into that. The state troopers are not going to buy into that. The rest of this world are not going to buy into that. So don't start them off with that idea. Woe to them that call evil good and good evil. We all need correction. And that brings us to point number 16, failing to train humility. When I started doing this series, I didn't have this point in there. And then after watching some young men grow up and seeing some that I'll describe to you, I realized the importance of putting this in here. Humility, in Proverbs chapter 6, it says there are six, yea, seven abominations that the Lord hates. Six, yea, seven things that the Lord hates. What is the very first item on the list? A haughty look. Pride. Arrogance. Here's why this is so important. Sin is a dangerous, dangerous, evil thing. But some sins thrive in some environments and some sins thrive in other environments. Like plants. Where does corn grow really well? In a sunny field. Corn grows well in a sunny field. I don't think corn grows that well in a jungle. It's just not a, 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 corn, a corn environment. Where does mold grow? You know, if you have not checked the crisper in your refrigerator in some time, <laughs> and you start looking in, in the bottom is up there, if you look, there there'd be all kind of things that might be growing down there in the refrigerator that would not grow well out on you know, a sunny field. Pride can grow really easily within a church or a religious family. Being a meth dealer, not so much. You know, if I showed up this weekend and we're talking, say, by the way, I got a meth lab, you need some meth. That's not going to fly. You know, that is not going to fit among believers. But you look at the Gospels. Who does Jesus have the most severe condemnations for in, throughout the Gospels? It is the Pharisees. And what does he say about them over and over and over? All their works they do to be seen of men. You look at they who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. They love the chief seats and the titles and, and to be seen praying. And, and they look, pride and arrogance can grow really easily in a family focused on God. When they let the shift, focus fit, shift from God to themselves. And you see that in the Pharisees. Why do they want to stand on that street corner and pray? So that other people will glorify God? No. It's here. And so I want to tell you about a couple young men. Both of them came from very uh, active families. Regularly at church. A lot of things commendable in the two families. And very, very conservative families extremely conservative in many way families. And I watch these two young men grow up and be ruined by pride. And stop and think over here. I, you love your children. And when they do something good, it's, you, you should encourage them. But watch how you do it. And what I'm going to describe now is not what happened necessarily what happened in the guys I'm about to describe, but I'll describe them to you in a minute. But what's going to happen if when there's 
maybe you're having a little thing for the kids, learn how to sing or something, and your little boy gets up, you know, on a Sunday afternoon and sings a song, and you say, oh, you did so much better than the other boys. You're the best song leader. You're going to be the best. Oh, you, your memory verse was so much better. There's a difference between encouraging a child and letting them feel good about doing good and making them egotistical little Pharisees. There's a big difference in that. One of these young men got to be, he was, his father came to, after they were worshiping somewhere else, I won't go, I, I will tell you this much, I was talking to him one time, I said, you've got a problem with arrogance. And he said, I'm a sociopath. And this was in his 20s. And he was so arrogant. And but he said, I go to a therapist. He said, I'm a sociopath. He said, I look at everybody else like they're just sitting around in their underwear. Just that's how much above everybody he just felt. And I remember sometime before that, I tried to talk to him about something because he was making some decisions in not a good biblical direction. And I don't remember which $5 words he started throwing around. Why There was no sense in us talking about it because we had different I don't know, bias constructs or, or something or another. You know, there was no point in talking. It's just arrogant. One time his father came to me. And I remember when he was like nine and his dad wanted him up front. And, you know, active in, or 9, 11, 12, 13. And just, and his dad was always impressed with how smart he was. His father came to me one time after they were worshiping elsewhere. He said, I'm ha I want to talk about my son. He said, I'm having trouble with him. I said, let me ask you some questions because I wanted to help him see where the problem was because he'd always been so impressed with his son. I said, is your son intelligent? Oh, yes. You know, is he zealous? Yes. And I asked some qualities that I knew the boy had. And the dad's, yes, yes. And I said, is he humble? And dad looked down and looked up and said, no. And that was exactly the problem. And he had helped create that problem. Another young man, bright boy, real good song leader, Talented, a lot of ways. When he was 15, I talked to him. I said, you got an ego problem. His immediate response was, I'm a teenager. Of course I got an ego. That was his response. A few years later, he was in college. I got a call. I assumed he had given my name as a reference. So I want to be honest in the reference. It's a preacher in another state. And he said, yeah, we got this young man down here. And he said, uh, we're thinking about having him, you know, work with us, you know, I kind of work along with this other preacher there. Uh, and he's asking me about it. So I said, well, I, said, I listed some qualities. You know, it comes from good family. There's this, 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 this. I said, but I'll tell you the same thing I told him. He's got an ego problem. This preacher, rather well-known preacher, laughed and said he didn't think that would be a problem. Really? A boy has the same core problem as a Pharisee and you think, yeah, well, if we deal with that, that's not a problem. Well, it turned out to be a problem. A couple years later, the young man came back to Pennsylvania. He was upset with me. And he wanted to talk to me. He said, you told two preachers that I had an ego problem. I said, no, I said, one, I told one preacher you got an ego problem. Well, this other preacher said two. And I pointed out, you know, if you stink <laughs> and you walk into a room, people didn't have to tell you that you stink for other people to find out that you stink. But the first preacher, you know, had eventually got fed up with him and apparently said, well, Scott Smelter said you had an ego problem. One time he was home and he was, he was leading singing. And he walked down like a Phil Donahue deal, you know, down there in the middle, you know, turning the people this way and that and doing his arms around and everything. And it was really distracting. And he, one of the sisters talked to him about it later. And he came and he talked to me about it. 
And I reminded him of some other behavior where we're just like upstaging things. And he goes, well, I just like to be the center of attention. When we're singing praise to God, who's the center of attention? It's not the song leader. When we're talking about the word of God, we should be focused on what God wants. Yes, it's good for our young men to learn how to teach, to learn how to lead singing, but don't let it become a performance ego thing for them. And sometimes families that are trying really, really, really hard to have their kids involved in all sorts of spiritual things miss the entire thing because they let this become a selfish thing. And that's what Jesus condemned so harshly. So don't do that. I'm not going to have time to cover everything in this lesson today, but I want to finish talking about this because it's that important. We've done a couple of tests over the weekend. We're going to do another one now. It's the fool test. And you can find out, for those of you that are raising kids, you're about to be able to analyze and find out whether or not one of your kids is being a fool or not. Don't worry. It's very curable. <laughs> and don't be surprised if you, we're going to use Bible verses to do it. Don't be surprised if you diagnose your child and that they found test positive for being a fool. Um, there's verses that will do that for us. And you can test yourself. Now, most of us, sometime over the last couple of years, took a COVID test now and then. And I always had to wait 15 minutes to find out if I tested positive or not. This one's real easy. In about two minutes, you're going to know whether or not you test positive. And if you're thinking about your children, you're going to know which ones test positive. The beauty of it is you don't have to quarantine and wait two weeks. You can get over it pretty quick, but you got to identify it. So, Proverbs. Open your Bible to Proverbs. We're going to read a few verses, and you'll find out how to diagnose. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 5. What does a wise person do when they have an opportunity to learn? A wise man will hear and increase learning. But what does a fool do? End of verse 7. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. So a wise man, there's another verse in Proverbs that says, instruct a wise man and he'll become wiser still. But over and over in Proverbs it says, fools hate to be corrected. If you've got a child, and when they're corrected, they appreciate it. And they apologize. And they're glad, and they want to do better. That's a wise child. That one tests negative for being a fool. That's a wise child. If you got a child and he hates to be corrected, he just tested positive. Now you can help him change that. And you, as we read these verses, adults, apply this to yourself. Do you appreciate correction or do you hate it? And by appreciate, I don't mean if another brother says or one of the shepherds say, I'd like to talk to you about something. You know, I'm concerned about this. I don't mean you're going, oh, goody, I did something wrong. But I mean realizing it sounds like something's wrong here. I want to listen and see what it is. And it, it may hurt, and then you realize, oh, I see what you're saying. And, and then you, but you listen and you say, I want to work on that. That's wisdom. But if you stiffen up your back and you're like, I'm not going to be wrong on this, and you hate being corrected, you just tested positive. Listen to these verses. Chapter 9, verse 8. End of verse 8. Rebuke a wise man, he will love you. Verse 9, that's the end of verse 8. 
uh, beginning of verse 9, give instruction to a wise man, he will be wiser still. But look at chapter 12, verse 1. Proverbs 12, verse 1. Whoever loves instruction loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 15. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he who heeds counsel is wise. Chapter 15, verse 5. A fool despises his father's instruction. This is Proverbs 15, 5. A fool despises his father's instructions, but he who receives correction is prudent, is why. Same chapter, two more verses. Verse 31. The ear that hears the rebukes of life will abide among the wise. But then in verse 32, he who disdain in, disdains instruction despises his own soul. Men, women, as you read that, where do you see yourself? If you despise correction, you want to do right, you want to do good and everything, but when you're wrong, you don't want to admit it? When you owe your wife an apology, you don't want to say you're sorry? When you owe your kids an apology, you don't want to say you're sorry? When you're wrong at work, no, 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 you're not wrong, it was somebody else's fault. In the garden, when Adam and Eve sinned, what's the first thing they did? Hid. What's the second thing they did? Blame somebody else. If that's you, you have tested positive for foolishness. If that's you, and right now you're thinking, that's right, I need to change my attitude to correction. Guess what? You're already getting better. You see, you don't have to stay there. It's not like COVID. It's, it's not like, well, it's going to be a lot. No, you can decide. I'm going to listen to correction. And if you, listen, if you needed that correction from the Word of God, all Scripture is inspired and is profitable for correction. If you listen to those verses and it's stung at home and you realize that that's a problem you have and it entered your heart and you decided you want to do better, you're already being wise. We're all foolish sometimes. And as you thought about your kids and you thought, you know, that one's wise, that one's wise. <laughs> I was a problem middle child, by the way. That, <laughs> he's being a fool. He doesn't have to stay there, but help him get out of that. Encourage him in doing what's right. Correct him when what's wrong. Teach him to have a security and a self-respect, but not a pride. Here's one of the differences between a righteous person and a self-righteous person. Self-righteous person wants to be better than other people. A righteous person, let me put it this way. You as saints of God, are you expected by God to be holier than the world? Yes, you are. You've been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. And it says in 1 Peter, be holy even as he who called you is holy. So if you're a Christian, you are holier than other people. Holier, it's connected word sanctified. The Bible says without sanctification, nobody's going to see God. Hebrews chapter 12. So you are holier than other people. But what, how do people describe a self-righteous person? Holier than thou. Well, it's your job to be holy, but the righteous person isn't glad that he's holier than everybody else. The righteous person wishes everybody else would be holy too. If tomorrow everybody in town decided to love God with their heart, soul, and mind and love their neighbor as himself, everybody decided to, if they were married, to be true to their family, everybody decided to tell the truth, and you were not the holier person, you were average. You know, you were like everybody else wanting to do right. The righteous person would be glad. What does the self-righteous person want? Luke 18, 9. Jesus spoke this parable unto certain of them that were trusted in themselves that they were righteous. A Pharisee went to pray and he said, God, 
I thank you that I'm not like other people, especially that publican over there, and start bragging about what he did. Self-righteousness wants to exalt self. Righteousness wants to humble self before God and is thrilled when other people are doing the same. Raise your children to have humility. Don't focus on home income over home outcome. We've got, I'm, I'm just going to touch on this real quickly. Better is a fear of the little with the fear of the Lord and great treasure than great treasure and turmoil with it. Better is a dish of vegetables where love is than a fat knock served with hatred. It's the home, not the house. It's the family, not the stuff. Do our homes reflect scriptural priorities or cultural priorities? Titus said, train the young women to love their husbands, love their children, be sober-minded, chaste, workers at home, kind, being in subject to their own husbands. We pointed out the other day, that doesn't mean that a woman can never help bring income into the family. The worthy woman, who is very focused on her family, in Proverbs 31, did that. She made garments. She took them to the uh, merchants who then sold them to other people. That helped bring in income. Her family was you know, well clothed and ready for winter and everything. She considered a field and bought it, but she's dedicated to her home. And we live in a culture, and this is an exercise I sometimes do with young men uh, when I'm working in some of these camps along with Joe and others. Sometimes I'll take a young men and we're gonna progress them through life real quick. And I'll have a prop over here like a Pepsi bottle or something because it's gonna end up being the baby in a minute. But I'll say, okay, let's kind of move him through because this is maybe a high school junior. Uh, so we, we graduated from high school. We send him to college. What are you going to study? And he picks a major. And then you're there, and he meets a girl. What's her name? Somebody gives a name. Maria. He met Maria. And then what's her major? And he picks a major. And then you get engaged. You're getting married. How much money are you making? And sometimes he's got a realistic number. Sometimes he doesn't. How much money is she making? Sometimes realistic. Sometimes it's not. And we start adding up. So now you got this much money. Now start buying stuff. What kind of house you want? What kind of car you want? How, what kind of curve? What toys you want? And we start buying a bunch of stuff. And then all of a sudden, I take that Pepsi bottle. Wham! <laughs> and I hand it to him. So who's going to take care of that baby? The point is, children need time. And, we're, and, and what a lot of people now, the norm is just turn that baby over to, you know, daycare. And babies, a few weeks, they're serious. I, if anybody wants to talk to me later, I'll tell, I'm no, I know people that run a daycare and try to do a good job. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you just one story because we're getting short time. Lovely old couple, they operate a small daycare, and they found a six-year-old violating a one-year-old. And there were reasons because of that coming from who was chosen to babysit and the perverse family that person came from. When they reported to higher ups, I don't remember if it was state or corporate, this is what they were told. Keep it quiet. The amount of sexual perversity that's going on in this country, there are websites where you can go to to find offenders, and it's scary sometimes to see how many caught offenders are living in a neighborhood. And a lot of children are being victimized. And some of those children, not only are they suffering from it, but then they turn around and they victimize other children. It cascades downward. They were told to keep it quiet. These people were Christians. They didn't keep it quiet. They told all of the parents what happened and what steps they were going to do to take it. And they love the kids that they're taking care of. But the fact is, if you turn your children over to somebody else, often making very little while we make money for the family, what those kids need is their parents. Little kids need mom. They, and, and like one Reader's Digest article said years ago, you're not going to find somebody that's going to give your child what you would do out of love that they're only doing for money. There's a lot of poorly served children in this country because parents just aren't taking time to raise their children. Um, 1 Timothy 6, the love of money is root of all of Underestimating threats, we've got to stop, so I'm just going to click through this. Entertainment media, internet pornography, offenders, predators, old and young. Some of the agendas going on in the schools right now, 
Uh, this whole transgender thing, there's a book I would recommend. It's called Irreparable Damage. It is not written by a Christian. Not everything in it is from a biblical point of view. It's a secular uh, journalist, but it's a helpful book because if you know of a teenager who's having trouble with this, girls are being encouraged not to listen to anything from the patriarchy. So if you show them something written by a man, they're not as likely to have written it. This is a female author, and she would allow some things that you and I wouldn't allow, but her book is about the social contagion that's going on among young girls. It's being promoted in a lot of the schools, and it's promoted by YouTube influencers and the therapist, and the pattern, it's, it's insane. And this book documents what's going on. In Britain, the ratio of girls wanting to be transformed uh, into men has gone up over 4,000%. And Britain is ahead of us now because they're starting to come to their senses. The NHS announced just within the last couple of weeks that they're recommending not putting you know, these little girls do hormone treatments and earn surgery and things because they said, it turns out this is a phase and most of them will get past it. But a lot of this is, a spe you know what? 11, 12, 13, 14 is an awkward age for a whole lot of reasons. Adults, remember age 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. It was awkward. There were awkward things. Now imagine you're in your school where there is a club and everybody in that club will be celebrated and nobody in that club can be criticized. And you're feeling a little bit of a misfit, guess what? And it, 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 it takes advantage of vulnerable people, people with personality disorders, people who are struggling already and then they're told all sorts of horrible things like, girl, oh, and you're good at math? You're part boy. Boy, you like music? You're part girl. Really? Mozart? <laughs> you know, Bach? Beethoven? They were girls? It's, there's a lot going on horrible with that. I don't have time to keep talking about it, but I re that book diagnoses what's going on and it becomes a social contagion. And then you got a group of girls and all five of her friends are all going, you know, some other gender thing. And so to be cool, they're fitting in. Like one teenage girl said in Britain, lesbian isn't cool. Trans is what's cool. And the schools are promoting it. Watch out for a lot of this stuff. Presuming medical solutions for behavior issues. There's medicines people need. There are all sorts of things like this. I don't have time to talk about number 19. If you want to talk about that with me later, do so. Um, and if you want to talk about this with me later, the difference between a pleaser and a strong-willed, I can talk about that with you later, but we're out of time. But I'm glad we talked about the things that we did, but we need to wrap up. If you, after thinking about the different things that we have in relationship to our God, or our children, if we transform that and start thinking about our relationship to God, think about the prodigal son. It's a son who's done very poorly, and he comes back to his father. And that represents us. We've all been prodigal sons at some point or another. The prodigal son wanted the blessings and not the responsibilities. And you know what? There's been times in your life and my life when we didn't want God's rules, but we always wanted his blessings. We wanted the sun to come up. We wanted God's oxygen in the air. We wanted his water. And we wanted his plants and animals. We wanted his blessings, but we didn't want a relationship in his rules. And all we like sheep have gone astray. But the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. And God wants us to come back to him. And when the prodigal son realizes what a fool he had been, he comes back, and his father runs to meet him because draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh unto you. If there's sin in your life, humble yourself and come back to your God. If there's sin in your life, and you're a Christian, and you realize it, make it right with your God. If it's something of a public nature, 
make it right with the brother. If it's something you need to make right with your family, make it right with your family. If you're not a Christian, you want to be baptized into Christ for the remission of all those sins through his grace and blood, come forward as we stand and sing.